Welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY at City University in Manhattan in New York City. It's week 11 of our talks and 11 weeks every day we talk five times a week with, with theater artists uh, from New York, from uh, America, but mostly, you know, uh, from around the world. Globally, if you look at our um, announcement on the website, you will, will find out, but it's been uh, very eye-opening uh, to see how our colleagues and friends around the world are experiencing this time of Corona uh, in, uh, in their own country, in their own four walls and uh, how vastly different it is country to country, how significant politics and politi political leadership is, how significant the changes and support for the arts are, what a difference it makes so that yes, though, you know, looking now at structures in a way, uh, everything is being uh, barely put to the open in front of our eyes in the light of the sun through this corona virus, a catalyst that, that kind of uh, like an x-ray shows what is what. And, uh, and as some say, like in the, on the ocean and the blood recedes and we see who has clothes on and who not, what's working and what is not. And yes, there are systems that to work better. It's still catastrophic uh, in the US, over 1 million um, um, infections. Um, and the next one is Brazil. And uh, I think even Italy is two or 300,000. So, and we do not know what will happen. Uh, will there be second, third waves? Numbers are not good from countries that reopened. Infections are showing up again. And of course, for us who are in the world of theater and performance, it's uh, devastating news. We do not know when we will open. We've been hit hardest and first. Uh, people are out of work, out of jobs. Uh, the next nine, 10 months, everything has been canceled. And, um, and theater artists have been freelancing so much, often also do work in the service industry in restaurants and other, this also doesn't exist. So um, it's a, a terrible uh, situation. The unemployment in the US is close to 50 million, unimaginable and uh, social unrest on the streets for good reason erupted uh, this kind of a match that was put to the gasoline through confinement and, and mishandling um, of this crisis um, and the killing of George Floyd. And, uh, and this week we have been, uh, have been focusing on this. We heard from the National Black Theater, from uh, um, uh, our friends, uh, Hope, uh, from uh, uh, our friends uh, yesterday, Avoye Tiempo, and, um, and before from Camila Budot, James Scruggs, so many. And today we have with us, um, in Japan, uh, they would say a living legend. Uh, 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 this is uh, Woody King Jr., someone who for 50 years, actually it's exactly 50 years, uh, ran a, a black theater at the New Federal in New York. He is called The King, which is also his name, but he, this is all he's called, and he has seen decades and over and has been deeply involved in, um, in what has happening. So uh, Woody, first of all, thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Where are you right now? I'm in my apartment in New York, and uh, I'm sequestered. I like everybody else. I go out with my gloves and my uh, mask when I go out to uh, get uh, essentials to exist within the apartment. But it's the first time I would say uh, I've had a chance to deal with all the essential things that I have in the apartment and the things that are not essential at all. Um, I, I got over, you know, six or 700 books. And I said, let me go through them and see what hard covers the first editions. And lo and behold, I got about 150 first editions. So I said, wow, what can I do with these? So I just put them in a box. And perhaps when the pandemic is over, I will take them out again. Uh, and then there's so many things that you can get rid of, including um, articles that, um, especially when you are uh, uh, 50 years old, uh, reviews that you got in 1971, covers of magazines when you got in, in 73. You said, well, what use are they now? That's, those are uh, 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 focus questions. Uh, you focus uh, in on uh, 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 the rest of your life and you 
I said, wow, I read this play, but I read this play in 1997. Let me read it again. Cause I don't, you know, you don't remember. You mm -hmm. remember, ah, you didn't do it. Why didn't you do it? Why didn't you produce this play in 1997? Uh, that's uh, what sequestering really means and come to mean mm -hmm. that within the structure you are, you find yourself, you work it out. It's like Zoom. I think I was talking to uh, my wife. I said, wow, man, four months ago, no one had heard of Zoom. And now everyone is talking about Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, the world has really, really changed. What is your neighborhood? When you look out of the window, what street are you on? In the uh, Riverside Drive. Riverside Drive. Uh, yes. I look so, out the window and uh, other people living on Riverside Drive. I do exercises uh, daily. And I look out my window and um, I count the number walking past on the other side of the street with mask on. And... Uh, children with masks on and those who do not wear masks. And I said, well, wow. it's always in that hour, 15, 20 minutes. Um, uh, it's, it's like nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah. This was an, a, a very uh, emotional, tough week, a hard week. Uh, um, galvanized the movement. How did you experience this week? Uh, George Floyd, the killing, and uh, the demonstrations. What comes to your mind? What came to your mind? Well, you know, I've, I've lived through uh, uh, other periods of time where uh, our heroes uh, was killed. Uh, and, uh, but George Foreman, I mean, George Floyd is, um, a hero uh, because it was televised. It was seen by a camera and everyone witnessed it. And so therefore there could be no excuses. Asphyxiation, it, it was very uh, clear. It he was asphyxiated and he was, he couldn't breathe. And uh, uh, um, that enraged us all. Okay, uh, Breonna Taylor's um, um, killing was uh, the, uh, you know, when you break in someone's house without a permit, and I understand they uh, made a law that fast, that can be no longer happen. You cannot break in without a search warrant. You got to have a, you must have a search warrant now. So, uh, and uh, uh, George Floyd's uh, uh, murder, <laughs> that's the best way to put it, um, has uh, caused across the world reactions. And these reactions has caused uh, uh, a kind of uh, looking at reality. And they are all very angry, very pissed off, very uh, concerned. And so changes are made, unemployment happened, unemployment as a result of uh, 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 the pandemic, uh, cor coronavirus. And uh, all of these things are, are happening. Uh, I just read about um, Darren Walker at the Ford Foundation and uh, how they are making uh, drastic, drastic changes uh, in uh, uh, dealing with um, all of the unemployed, all of the uh, small corporations uh, and nonprofits uh, just to keep people uh, uh, on the payroll, if you will, and alive, if you will, uh, during this crisis. So I look at the uh, George Floyd uh, uh, murder as a mother, a brother, no, no, as a family, having lost uh, a beloved son, and 
they are grieving. And that, that grieving is not unlike all these other uh, 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 killings, but we didn't have instant replay on things like Emmett Till or uh, things like uh, um, the murder of Fred Hampton or, you know, uh, we didn't have that then. The new technology has brought it into our living room. Uh, uh, it's almost like uh, as we are talking now, you and I, this is in people's living room and they can look at it and they can say, wow, we want to uh, be informed. And uh, you uh, and the Siegel Institute are informing us about issues and uh, things that we can talk about. You got, you probably do understand. Before uh, there was uh, these kind of talks, uh, it was confined to the black community. Nobody listened. Yeah, you had no ears. No, nobody, nobody could listen. They had the wait. Uh, for the black newspaper, which came out once a week. Uh, black radio, which uh, is not listened to by white Americans. Uh, so uh, it was very difficult. They would listen to uh, music, hip hop, rap had not come in, uh, but uh, you know, it, it, the new media I think it's sort of like reaching everybody and everybody uh, is our audience and everybody is worldwide. You know, I think uh, uh, the Siegel Talks, uh, we said earlier, reached something like a couple of hundred countries. Hmm. T take us back to the moment when you started uh, the New Federal Theater. What was your your idea also for, for a black theater in New York and America, what, what was your vision, your dream, your hope? When, when, when did that happen? 1970. Uh, uh, I came from uh, five years at a company called Mobilization for Youth on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, and uh, uh, we trained uh, young people uh, in the arts, dance, theater, and film. And when the director moved to a company called Henry Street Settlement, uh, I moved there with him. And uh, they had uh, just a, a building called the Henry Street Playhouse. And we started uh, programming uh, plays to have into the theater because he was a new director. He was starting anew. And the first thing was he wanted to build onto the center. And he built another small theater, two other small theaters. And mm -hmm. I was the programmer. And, oh, really? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in 1970, he named uh, me um, the director of the arts. And what did I want to call the theater? And I thought about it, reading Orson Welles and John Houseman and uh, those kind of contributors to the American theater scene. I named it the New Federal Theater. And uh, it became a tag that stuck. And what I wanted to do uh, was, uh, I think what I wanted to do was sort of like integrate into uh, the American theater. So it was people of color and women uh, to sort of like integrate them into the American theater. But the difficulty I saw almost immediately was if I did the play and it won awards, then the whole play could go in to the other theater whether it was the New York Shakespeare Festival, uh, Chelsea Theater Center, the American Place Theater, uh, Lincoln Center Theater, or 
and then it spread. I could go to the Bermuda International Theater Festival, uh, the Pan-African Theater Festival, if I took the whole project and the interference would be minimal. And these people who were in the play from Denzel Washington uh, back then, uh, uh, or Elizabeth Van Dyke back then, uh, it was just so many artists, Garrett Morris, people you see on television now who are older, <laughs> was there at the beginning. Samuel Jackson. Yeah, yeah Samuel Jackson, Latanya Richardson Jackson um, uh, did plays with us. And Tazaki Shangis for Colored Girls who can consider suicide when the rainbow is enough. We did her play. And uh, so, and we can move the whole play because people like uh, Bernie Gersten, Joseph Papp, uh, Lynn Meadow, uh, Robert Calvin, they if it had won all the awards, they, they didn't come in and change it. Mm -hmm. It stayed intact. And so uh, if a critic came to see it, he said, wow, this is the same play I saw at the New Federal. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. It's just got, it just reaches now uh, uh, an audience that they didn't have there. Well, it was only black people there. But as they died off and that system said, oh, we got to change. We got to um, uh, start doing plays by uh, uh, our white writers. <laughs> hmm. Did you feel that at the time you started out, were you part of the New York theater scene or was it kind of separate? Um, no, 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 we weren't a part of the New York theater scene. I was a part of it because um, I came in with all these degrees. <laughs> you know, I came in uh, uh, like a tornado. I came in, you know, it's like you couldn't tell me I couldn't do anything. You know, I did the Voodoo Macbeth. That was 20 characters. The Conjure Man Dies. Um, I did play, huge plays because I had... Uh, uh, the backing of the Great Henry Street Settlement. And it wasn't long before, as a result of that, I was working for, uh, on special projects with the Rockefeller Foundation, special projects with the Ford Foundation. And just, that just spread it, my, uh, uh, in a sense, just spread it, my visibility and uh, my use of, uh, theater surveys led me to other writers, other productions, the Free Southern Theater, uh, uh, theater in uh, uh, other cities, uh, theater artists who wanted to be in New York and would send stuff and they would come into New York, you know? And that still is applicable to, to, to today. Today, our latest, for example, uh, uh, a year and a half ago, we did a play called Looking for Leroy. That just came to me in the mail. Mm -hmm. And we did it as a production. Because from the inception, we worked with the, uh, 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 the Actors Union, Actors Equity Association. And I think it's because I was a member so early, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just felt it was something that, uh, uh, we should do. Um, a lot of companies do not do that. And so uh, later in life, um, artists, actors, uh, if they are not a part of that system, they're not integrated into the American theater. Hmm. I mean, do, do you see right now in these weeks the, the dear white Broadway manifesto and uh, people say Broadway is racist? Um, do, do you feel things have changed? Was it the same at that time? Is it uh, better now? Is it worse? Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's changed. At, at one time, New Federal might be doing seven or eight plays a year. We had three spaces. Um, and... Uh, at that time, it did not cost as much. 
um, to do a play on Broadway now, a regular play may cost a million and a half. You know, there we don't have those kind of investors on black theater. Hmm. Um, musicals may cost three or four million. You know, maybe maybe more. Uh, there's a play on Broadway that uh, the pandemic, of course, closed it down. Um, called "Ain't Too Proud" by the Temptations, and uh, all of the Temptations are from Detroit, Motown Records. And I'm from Detroit. I grew up in Detroit. So it's like guys you would see in a restaurant, guys you would see at the gym. Now uh, you have actors playing them. You know, mm -hmm. but back then uh, uh, the change is they're part of history. Like New Federals will be without a question some sort of part of history. And we have to have hopefully uh, discussions like this to uh, help correct that history. Um, we're in the National African American Museum in Washington. Uh, we're in the Schomburg in New York. Uh, you name the muse uh, museum, our work and uh, our history is is included in that. But mm -hmm. Frank, you know mm -hmm. uh, this medium, uh, and I hope you recorded this, yeah. uh, is um, uh, something that is collectible. It is useful in uh, research. Uh, young people cannot say, uh, wow, I didn't know that existed. It does exist. And they said that young people, um, 71, 72, 73, 74, up to maybe 1976, um, could say, I did not know that. And then we started winning awards uh, prior to that, um, the Drama Desk Award for uh, Black Girl. So the white world knew about Black Girl. Then a movie was made with Ossie Davis. Um, uh, the Taking of Miss Janie, Drama Critic Circle Award we won. And those kind of awards had not been afforded to African-American theaters mm -hmm. uh, before. It was a raising in the sun and then the big leap forward. And that was a gap between. And now uh, I would say, uh, we might do two plays a year because of the cost. When we would do the same amount of money, we'd do four plays a year. But the cost is junk. Director's cost, set cost, all the materials. It's not just actor's cost. Well, uh, a full character play you could do with uh, nine people. That may take 15. They gotta get paid, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, uh, I don't wanna say it's like, but uh, uh, if you look at a Zoom show like, like like this, you need a producer, you need some, you, you always need something else, someone else to assist. You can't do it all, you cannot. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you try to find people who, uh, experts in that field to work on it because they want to with the, uh, uh, integrate into American system. And my search found woman, women uh, set designers, women light designers, women sound designers, and they would uh, come in for those six weeks and you have to house them, pay their transportation in, but they would get the visibility that they had, they had not had before in small town. So mm -hmm. the change, uh, I don't know, uh, the change uh, as far as I'm concerned has been uh, 
about is going to continue about um, George Floyd. The change has not been like this worldwide ever. Hmm. Um, so in the beginning of the new federal theater, you produce shows that would be on Broadway. You right away with your means, you had shows that you could put up. I produced shows that could be produced, integrating into the American theater was not on Broadway. So you started at the Henry Street settlement, and then it would go over with your friends and the. No, no, they were my friends. Joseph Papp would, would come over and see the plays. You remember Joseph Papp? Sure, of course. Okay. Come over and see, I like this. And he would say, wow, um, I don't have to do anything. Just move this to Lincoln Center. That's all I have to do. Mm -hmm. And pick up, start the payroll then. That's all he had to do. Mm -hmm. What happened to the Black theater movement? I, I think if I remember right, numbers are down in America. Theater is like dedicated to, you know, to, to Black writers, Black uh, 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 theater work. Um, and uh, did you, is that, do you confirm that, that there has been, is less attention being paid? How is your funding situation? Yes, so less, less attention being paid because uh, uh, these foundations, federal, city, state, and private uh, now uh, can go to the Signature Theater, can go to uh, white nonprofits, and they are all over New York. They're all over uh, America. The Goodman Theater in Chicago, the Seattle Rep, and they can go to them because they may have a, a marketing department of 15, 20 people in that marketing department, in the audience development department, in that subscription department, you know? And uh, they could get more bangs for their buck. And uh, they were asked to uh, buy more sophisticated fundraiser. Hmm. By, uh, but the black theater movement, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, still exists. Mm -hmm. Who who are the who are the your colleagues in the in the black theater movement? You exchange with you uh, in the American landscape. Well, uh, black spectrum theater. Uh, we're all part of something called a coalition of theaters of color. Uh, National Black Theater, uh, Mind Builders, uh, the St. Louis Black Repertory Theater, Eileen Morris at the Ensemble Studio Theater, Plowshares in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, these theaters all exist to produce African-American works, you know? And then there's the National uh, Black Theater Festival in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. That's run by Jackie Alexander and the wife of the late Larry Leon Hamlin, Sylvia Hamlin, they run that. So uh, those are, people we relate to at least monthly or weekly. You know, it's like a, how you doing? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how's it going there? Or, um, or what have you, you know? Mm -hmm. The Billy Holiday Theater. These are just the name uh, uh, components and people who view these theaters as uh, uh, part of the Black theater movement. Hmm. Do you feel America has done enough to support the Black theater movement? No. So, you know, it's like, uh, uh, be, but neither has, uh, uh, well, America, yeah, America consists of 
Black Americans, white Americans, um, uh, and let's face it, the, the Black Americans individually, white Americans individually, foundations. It's just so many foundations, you know, you know, while $10,000 would mean the world to me, it doesn't mean anything for Lincoln Center. They want a hit. <laughs> they want a huge hit. But the pandemic is uh, sort of like bringing a light to uh, all of this. Now we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same situation, if you will, uh, that uh, we found ourselves in when we started up. And how is that? When we started up, we had a kind of energy, a kind of uh, need. And out of that energy and that need, um, uh, I could get a job at Henry Street. And out of that need, we could get someone into the New York State Council on the Arts, Mr. Vinette Carroll, the late Miss Vinette Carroll, or uh, into the National Endowment for the Arts uh, with uh, a man named Vantile Whitfield and A.B. Spellman. And um, these people were simply a phone call away. So that helped tremendously but they had very small budgets within the foundation, within federal city and state, you know? And you cannot make these calls anymore. There's nobody on the other line if you would make these calls at the moment. Nobody you can make these calls to who know you, who know your work. You have to send, uh, you know, something else. You know, first it went from uh, three or four page proposal in detail. Then it went to uh, VHSs. Then it went to, you got to send this and they may look at it, they may not. Mm -hmm. and so there was no structural support. It was support for projects and uh, and, uh, uh, and for individual plays, but not a sustainable support towards your organization. No. Hmm. The Henry Street Settlement uh, supported New Federal Theater as an organization, which meant a secretary, me, and uh, a coordinator, that was it. And they had trouble raising money for all their social programs. But we prevailed. We prevailed for <laughs> what, mm -hmm. years. And now we are on at uh, 543 West 42nd Street, where we rent space, have use of uh, three theater spaces. And 543, back in the day, was where Lee Strasberg of the Actors Studio uh, uh, held classes. And then it went into, into uh, oh, it was just a terrible rat infested building mm -hmm. until Castillo came in and remodeled it and redid it. And that was done through, uh, he's gone now, God rest his soul, Fred Newman. Fred Newman, yeah. It's in Hell's Kitchen, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> your, your idea to get involved theater, did it come out of the civil rights movement? Were you part of that? No. No, it came out of Detroit, out of the university. I went so to what was your idea? Why did you say, I'm going to do theater, or this is what I will, black theater, what, this I was is an actor. Mission. I was an actor. And I started a theater in Detroit. And... Um, I would come to New York once a year and uh, see plays. I would write letters. And uh, uh, these letters were answered sometimes. Sometimes they weren't. But I would write to people like Ozzie Davis and 
or Ruby D or Fred O'Neill, who's the head of the actors. Uh, he was the head of Actors Equity Association. Lloyd Richards, I would write to, cause he went to Wayne State where I went. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I was an actor, I came in and I did plays uh, for a while and uh, TV commercials at the beginning of that. And uh, I would take my money and uh, produce plays, took my money and bought property in Harlem and moved my family there. Hmm. So when you were in Detroit growing up, what was the moment or what was when you said, I'm going to become an actor, what did you see? Uh, a Raisin in the Sun toured and it came to uh, uh, a downtown theater and I had found a way that you could see plays if you wrote uh, uh, reviews of them for the small black newspapers around. <laughs> so I would go in and see a play and I got to meet um, the cast then of the touring A Raisin in the Sun. And uh, they were just wonderful. We, I would walk them from the hotel, I mean, from the theater back to their hotel, from the theater back to, and it was almost like, you again, you again, you are here again. <laughs> and uh, yes. And then I uh, started looking for uh, 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 theater schools in Detroit, uh, outside of the university, because you couldn't get any plays at the university. They Why were, couldn't you couldn't get in? Because you were black. They were doing. There was no chance. To get you in. could not get in the plays. It would be a white director. It would be a white play. It would be his interpretation of that play, you know? And so I went to a theater school, a very famous theater school. And at that theater school, um, a woman named uh, Teresa Way Merrill uh, was a grand dame who was in a wheelchair at that time. And she was the founder a Willow Way School of Theater. And it was in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. They would train me, but they told me right up, uh, we don't have any African-American actors here. You are, you are it. And you can be in these plays, but you cannot uh, do intimate roles with white women on the stage. They, they told me and they gave me a scholarship. And for, uh, that was my first uh, foray into uh, uh, this theater thing that uh, trained me to be an actor. But I got to four years, I got a certificate and uh, uh, she would give me uh, talks. And in those talks, she would let me know who's coming in this year uh, Ilka Chase, Harold Clurman, Basil Rathbone, all these famous actors. And they all urged me to check out New York. Mm. Now, how would I do that? <clears throat> how would how would how would you get to New York? You know? And uh and uh they had something called uh, you know, Detroit is an automobile city and you drive cars into Pennsylvania for uh, these companies. And the closer you could get to New York, usually was Pennsylvania and a bus from there into New York for two or three days and back to Detroit. We found ways <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to exist. You know, you find ways, you know. Hmm. Did you ever play when you studied for four years? Did you get a main role? Was there, was there ever a, was, a play a, by a black writer? No, these were all scenes, all scenes, or monologues or scenes. Hmm. You know, Harold Clorman uh, were contemporary uh, 
of so many New Yorkers. And he talked to me about the actor's studio, mm -hmm. you know, of which I'm very uh, in sync and a member now. Back then, nobody knew them. Yeah, yeah. The great Harold Kluman, who some people say talked the group theater into being and uh, actually also taught at CUNY um, where, um, and where, where we are. When you came to New York, did you feel the only chance to do your theater, you have to do it on your own, you have to be producer, you have to be um, um, the, the, the creative force behind it. Were, were, was there anything, any openings in what, what you know people now say, and you say too, in the kind of white theater, the theaters where you know it's run by white institutions, white people, Do, were, you, were there openings at that time of, um, of the late 60s, middle 70s, where we think of um, a time of change? Well, I didn't think of time would change, but I was very close with Wynne Hanman at the American Place Theater, very close. And, uh, but that was the, uh, and I, after that, I became close with uh, Joseph Papp at the Public Theater, mm -hmm. you know? And after that, uh, uh, Robert Calvin at Chelsea Theater Center. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, they were wonderful producers, wonderful producers, you know, but they had their agenda of plays and uh, they were, you know, they were going to do one or two plays a year out of 10, uh, 11 plays. They weren't going to jump in and mm -hmm. do a lot, a lot of plays by black authors. Mm -hmm. What did you learn most by, over those 50 years of producing, which is an incredible amount of time. And I really want to congratulate you and show all of our respect for being such a pioneer, for having carried that, uh, that wagon you know, through, through the fields uh, for so long and also so successfully. Um, what did you learn? What did, what did it teach you? Well, I would say uh, each play that you read must stand on its own and uh, deeply rooted in literature. You must be deeply rooted in literature. And uh, see, in, uh, uh, before coming to New York and in the early years of New York, um, literature, whether it was Chekhov or James Baldwin or Ralph Ellison or John A. Williams, um, uh, I am equally um, fond of all of them. Turgenev, First Love, I love that piece. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Novel, and, uh, novel, novella, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, pardon? If short, his short tale, First Love, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, I love that piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, then uh, I started uh, uh, reading African-American women literature, Louise Merriweather, um, Maya Angelou, her early, early work before, uh, because she was a dancer at first. And I thought that was fascinating. And of course, early work uh, that I adapted and did at the Lincoln Center for, for the Performing Arts, uh, Lincoln Center Museum for the Performing Arts, uh, was Langston Hughes's The Weary Blues, a series of poems and all that. Uh, the great Margaret Danner. My best friend was a novelist and uh, Ron Milner and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the librarian uh, in Detroit uh, was a German guy named Kurt Myers. Uh, he introduced me to Theater Arts Magazine. Uh, I don't know if you know Theater Arts Magazine, but it was it's beautifully printed, printed, uh, beautifully typeset. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I have some he, copies. Yeah, and some, and they published a play in every issue. Mm -hmm. 
and they would have these short articles. But uh, it was that kind of world, uh, Frank, back then that uh, one becomes engulfed in. That's, that's your life. That becomes who you are. And the deeper you go, the deeper you have to go to stay there, you know? And if there was a, uh, if, the, if, uh, if there was a book party, uh, I was always invited. I was mm -hmm. deeply rooted in literature, African literature, Willie Kosasili, uh from South Africa, uh, writers from other, uh, other states, playwrights. Um, I would find a way of find out what they had written uh, because they could only get a reading. There was no theaters in that town. And then uh, 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 the universities started really hiring African-American to run the, the work in theater, work in theater departments. And I became friends with them and they were women and they would graduate women and people and they had no place to go. And so the new federal theater uh, uh, was a place they could go after graduating if they could not get a teaching job. So it's a, it's a, it's a struggle, yes. It's still a struggle, yes. Um, we are uh, doing conversations Tuesdays in June. Uh, these are conversations with people who are now well known uh, in the world of acting and directing that started at New Federal Theater. Mm -hmm. Did you define your work? Is it is it political? What you do is it? Are you a political theater? No. It's each play is about, um, uh, and that's I guess that's everywhere. It's about its content and how it touches people. If it's a political love story, then we look at it as a love story, and that's what we deal with. If it's a political uh, drama slash drama, we look for the uh, dramatic structure and conflict in the play, not any political statement. So I don't know. Um, when, when you say political, uh, uh, I would say the murder of George Floyd is political, but the story is his brother and family, you know, it is not about the cops. It is not about anyone other than, say, his girlfriend, maybe. His child who must, his son that must grow up without a father. Those are the plays that we look for. Political, no, I don't get involved in that. Hmm. I, but for, for example, I don't think a, a play about uh, but, uh I don't I don't want to say Bush. Maybe I would. I don't think I'm Democrat, so I, you know. I, I no, I don't get involved in political plays. Hmm. In, in this time of Corona, where you said you looked through, you know, your books, your articles, and your writing plays, in this time, did something in you 
changed? Do you have a different awareness of having been confined at home for now almost three months? Um, do you feel for you also as a person, something has, uh, has happened or is this a time of, of, of wait and rest and you go back out and continue? No, no, something has changed. You know, it's like, uh, I can look around my apartment and whoa, I've got, you know, in my office here, I got, I think, three boxes of first editions. I think I said that earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I never knew I had that many books that was first editions. Mm -hmm. Okay. I got uh, maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten shelves of books. You know, my wife may have five or six shelves. So you go down the hallway, it's books, it's books. And, and in the years that I've been in this business, I've read almost all of these books. So I've come to a uh, conclusion that there are so many, I, I, a book is only in a series of ideas by one person and it is, and if you absorb them and listen to them, they will tell you a direction. They will give you an indication that this has happened before. Uh, uh, this pandemic uh, uh, might have taken another shape or form, but it has happened before. So, uh, you better, uh, 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 I don't want to say better, uh, you better be aware of it has happened before. Uh, the worst thing of all is if you are not aware that it has happened before. And so being at home, being observant, going through uh, uh, all this work, and uh, your wife, my wife really has to do it. And we've never been confined for three months. We've never been in one space. And we talk about everything. We may talk about politics, you know? Uh, we may talk about an artist and we may talk a, a great deal about uh, the discussions of rapping with artists, the Tuesdays in June, about uh, the wonderful journey of, uh, uh, of Essie Patha Murkison, uh, the wonderful journey of uh, Ruben Santiago Hudson. You know, these are journeys and you say, whoa, man. Um, and we'll talk about that. Mm. And they started off at New Federal. Mm. But you said, yeah. So you, you really made a great contribution. Do you think, I mean, in the moment we experience as theater makers, we are not essential, you know, it's, everything is shut down. And on the contrary, we would now con contribute to, you know, to the virus, to the spread of it. Um, normally we don't have money, we don't have space, no, we don't have, and then now we, it is even more obvious. Do you think when everything opens, theater is really needed? And do we, do we need, and I'm not just asking it rhetorically, but do you really, what do you think? Why do, why do we need theater? Well, uh, we need art. Art nourishes us. Um, whether it's a sculpture by Otto Niels, uh, a painting by Camille Yarbrough, uh, we need that. That nourishes us. We can look at that and uh, it makes you feel something. When you go to a play, um, we need to see ourselves somehow reflected in 
uh, the statement of the images that is projected on stage. We need a raised in the sun. We need to know that Claudia McNeil, oh, she's very similar to my grandmother. And you think, wow, grandmother's all over. We need a sister like Ruby D, who was in that play, or a brother like uh, Sidney Poitier. We need a reaffirmation. Art reaffirms who we are. And affirmation is the key to existing here in America. If you're not affirmed, you walk around uh, burning buildings at night, robbing banks uh, at night, uh, uh, killing, uh, putting, a, putting a Ku Klux Klan mask on and killing Emmett Till, throwing him in the river at night, you know? Peaceful uh, uh, riots happen at night because we don't have art or music or theater anywhere in our lives. We don't have anything that reaffirms who we are. So we will assume, which is a terrible thing to do, that uh, uh, I'm out here alone. So if I knock this window in and break in tomorrow night at this rally and steal a ham or steal something, it's, it's not gonna last more than a day, you know? So I say, wow, this, so they don't have a reaffirmation. They don't have an identity. Uh, art solidifies one's identity, you know? James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. I don't know, uh, and nobody knows my name. Uh, if Beale Street could talk. John A. Williams. Uh, Captain Black Man. I'm just throwing these out where mm -hmm. I've read them and there is a reaffirmation in them. You know? And that's what I try to do in my art. I looked at a film I made that was streamed yesterday from the Museum of Modern Art called Right On, starring the original last poets. And uh, with the advent of uh, television, Felipe Luciano, who was uh, in that film as a young man, maybe 18 or 19, as one of the last poets, did an introduction. And I looked at him now and in the film. And he's in Puerto Rico. So uh, art, again, Frank, uh, to answer your question, I hope I, I got it, but uh, I think art is an, a reaffirmation. It, it solidifies one's identity. And uh, in terms of identity in America, uh, one could say, uh, and James Baldwin said this, if you don't know who you are, and where you are, and what you are, uh, you will root for um, all the Indians being killed by Gary Cooper. When, you, as you, if you know who you are, you will realize, wait a minute, I'm the Indians. <laughs> I'm, you know, I wouldn't be rooting for Gary Cooper. 
But the story is about Gary Cooper. You understand? Mm -hmm. Some white guy wrote this story, and that's what it's about. And that's why I'm involved in the arts. It's told by me and some black writers. And people come because they see a reaffirmation. Now, after, I guess, 1971 uh, or two, that film I made and produced is just as fresh as it was then when we did it then with the last poets. Yeah, no, you made a made a made a great great uh, contribution uh, to to American art and American theater, um, and I think you're you're twice uh, you know, or your about uh, uh, that art actually in a way since everybody talks about defunding police, yeah, take some of that money and put it into art. It keeps us mm -hmm. a healthy society, a good society. So now, of course, we do need a, let's say, a police, you know, that there's domestic violence or other things. You know, we need some kind of a civic uh, a force, but, um, um, but not how it is how, how it is now and that art makes a, a contribution, uh, especially also in New York City, that makes the city um, what it is. We, we are coming closer, you know, to, to our end. I mean, two more questions. One is your, your colleagues now, let's say Nigel Smith at the Flea, um, Jonathan McCrory at the National Black Theater, or the Classical Theater of Harlem, how or the young writers or the next generation, the Susan Laurie Parks, Leonardo Katori Hall, and Thomas Bradshaw and everybody, how are you in contact with them? Do you feel this is now the next generation doing their thing? Are there crossovers? Well, uh, Jonathan McCoy uh, at the National Black Theater, we are, um, uh, I was very close with Barbara Antier uh, who founded the National Black Theater. Uh, I think the flea, uh, I'm not in contact with them because they do, um, uh, they did mostly white plays. Um, who else did you say? Um, Nigel Smith, who's now took over, and the other one is yeah, the Classical Theater of Harlem or others. So how do, how, or, or also the, the contemporary know. black playwrights and all of it. Do you feel, um, you are a part of, a, is that a, a, a living structure, you know, of black theater in New York? Or is it because the city is so big and so vast that um, there are also islands producing their work? Well, I, I think there are islands producing their work. I think you're right. Um, uh, Ty Jones at the Classical Theater of Harlem uh, uh, to produce outdoor theater uh, at Mount Marsh Park, I think is, wonderful. I just think it's absolutely wonderful. But what does he do in the winter? Um, his summer theater program is awesome. Um, but he's always looking for a space and funding for his theater. Um, I don't think the flea is uh, in our league. I think we are mm -hmm. about something else. Mm -hmm. uh, playwrights uh, want to get their work done. They just want to see it. They just want to see uh, the play up there. A lot of times it's ego. It's not ready to be put up there. Uh, a lot of times it's uh, ready and they don't have the uh, uh, personnel. Uh, they don't have the director who can give you direction. They don't have a producer who can uh, talk to them about it. Uh, art takes conversation, you know, whether it's over uh, coffee. In the old days, it would be in the coffee houses. In the new days, it's over a beer. Um, in the, you know, uh, in the new days, it's over dinner. Um, but it takes conversation. You got to talk about a piece of art. You got to talk about um, why this play uh, really works, but I don't have the money to do it. So the writer don't 
leave thinking you hated this play or her play. You, mm. you gotta tell them. And I think uh, uh, that's what's missing. And sitting across from them, um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult sitting across from them when you really want to do a play and don't have the money to do it. And it's very difficult to do, uh, uh, let's say Ty Jones doing a piece about the classical theater of Harlem, a piece of uh, Shakespeare. And, and it's really wonderful, but he doesn't have the money to do it. A classical play, and he, a Shakespeare or uh, some classical work. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think uh, you, 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 you really point out uh, that uh, um, there has to be a funding structure in place to support our Black uh, national theater, so who made such a great contribution um, as an expression of arts of, of, of people who of color, of course, live here, but also in the world you know, of theater, the innovations and, uh, and the contributions they have made, the unique way to see what we call life or to experience life and and to create meaning, but also I said, yeah, we, you know, we need to talk. It's about conversations. And I hope when all this is over and there will be many, many talks, there will be no ways of funding, perhaps also structural fundings of places and organizations, uh, less projects oriented. And, um, and that we all uh, look a little bit closer in how the distribution of uh, resources for making arts are made at the moment in America. And as, as uh, you point out, and so many others, and also this uh, your DOI theater movement, and all of it, they says, no, it's not just, it's not right, and it represents what is actually what's wrong. And um, as a closing um, um, question, we, we often do that to, to the young artists, the people who might now be listening, or to yourself when you were a young man coming from uh, Detroit and coming to New York. What, do you, what would you say to artists now at the moment if they are thinking about creating art, um, they're getting through Corona, through, through confinement, uh, through the lockdown? What do you think is of real importance? What is meaningful? What we all should be keeping in mind? Reading, reading. You must read. Young artists must read. You know, uh, I am... Uh, would advise uh, reading American Theater Magazine that would tell you what's going on in the theater across America. Read, read, read. And um, a young artist, a young black artist, he's got the Schomburg here. He's got Lincoln Center Library. He's got all these places with nothing but books and history. You got to be aware, you got to know in which direction you want to go and books will lead you there. You can't come in and wing it. You can't wing it anymore. You gotta have a direction and I think uh, uh, you can get so busy working and doing something and end up saying, oh, wow, this was wrong. This, God, uh, I should have done this differently. But it's right there in the book. It's right there in the Act of Prepares by Stanislavski. It's right there in any of those books, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is something what we what we what we um, can do and what we can, uh, can can control at the moment, and and, and reading and perhaps also writing uh, will become uh, something that we also have again a closer closer look. Woody, thank you so much. We should do that every day. And here, it's just we feel we are, we are scratching um, the surface, but I think we get an idea for an idea of what you did, what you stand for, um, that long history, that significant history, and also making New York, you know, what it is as a center. So your, your, your contribution is tremendous. 
and I do hope um, that uh, there will be ways to make uh, funding for black theater easier and to recognize it as a significant normal part of the landscape of American and theater and that we get away from the highly, highly commercial um, um, theater and uh, and um, as I mean, sometimes say, even the great chefs uh, von Gerichten's who have the $300 menu restaurants, they know, no, we should have a bistro restaurant where it's still <laughs> great food, but it's affordable. People can come together, families can come and enjoy it. And I think uh, uh, that great, great big industry of Broadway that also produces so many jobs and has uh, five, six, seven billions of revenues. So also we should find a way to distribute it. Also money from um, the US government. There's no ministry of culture here. It's a shocking, um, we just learned that uh, the first thing that Bolsonaro in Brazil did, the new president, he dismantled the uh, Ministry of Culture and destroyed uh, any, uh, any funding for p potential critical voices or voices that, as you, uh, Woody King said, they affirm, create an affirmation of who we are, where we come from, and where, where we are going to. So this was a most significant uh, contribution. Really, uh, really thank you for, for being with us. This is uh, the end of, uh, of this week's uh, talk. Next week, again, we take a, a, a flight across the world. We had this week four New York artists um, and uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, the French philosopher who talked to us about why we do need art. Um, but next week we go back to our format and we have uh, Peter Schumann with us as a American representative, the great, great Peter Schumann from the Brett and Puppet Theater in Vermont um, will talk to us about theater, about protests, about puppets, about life and uh, the meaning of it all. Um, we will have Govan Rubin and Terence Conrad from Malaysia, a theater company, a great theater company, partly also working with Australians to, uh, who um, also have once been here and hear about how they experience Corona. Uh, the brilliant Tanya Bruguera, uh, performance artist also, an installation artist from Cuba, very, very strong politically engaged um, um, artist. Uh, Tanya Bruguera will be joining us. Uh, Hope Azeda from Rwanda, who did see important work um, also after the genocide in Rwanda, the uh, reconciliation uh, work. And so uh, Hope Azeda will talk to us how it feels uh, uh, what it means to be a working artist in Rwanda at the moment uh, in, um, in Africa. And then uh, Saman um, Amini, a refugee from Iran who landed in the Netherlands and went to an acting school and uh, then created a work of his own, uh, a place uh, at the table is one of his works. Um, so he will tell us what it means uh, to, for an Iranian a refugee to come to another place, another town and to create art and um, and also in the in the time of Corona. So thank you for HowlRound for for um, uh, allowing us to, to have our Siegel talks with them each day um, in the week. It's a big commitment. So we think thank VJ, Thea, and Travis, and my Siegel team, Andy, and um, San Yang, and again Woody. Really, uh, thank you for. Um, for uh, for joining us and it's something everybody should listen to in the community and uh, also um, reach out to you and uh, help you to also get back how is the outlook will will you survive will the new federal theater survive we'll see it's still not clear right it's uh, it would be it yeah. would be tragic there are um some uh, estimation that a third perhaps of all nonprofits might close um, we don't know what will happen. It's a time of uncertainty, but as we all know, it is significant access to the arts, access to health, access to education, our human rights, and this is what a society has to do for its citizens. So thank you all, and I hope to see you all again next week. Thank you for our listeners for taking such significant time out of their days. Thank you, Woody, and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good reading. Bye-bye. <laughs>